Hello YouTube, today I'm going to be adding all of the awesome level 9000 factions onto the Smash Up tier list. I'm also going to be taking another look at the final core set tier list because there is going to be one revision, but I'll explain all of that later. This video is broken down into parts. The first part explains how we're making the tier list. I have made some slight tweaks as well as adding a new characteristic. So if you've already seen the core set tier list, it's probably worth watching the introduction again. After you've seen it this time though, I don't anticipate it changing at all, so feel free to skip it after this video. This is then followed by each of the awesome level 9000 factions before concluding with the final tier list and my final thoughts. For each faction, I'll be ranking them against 9 characteristics, which will give them a score and that will place them onto the tier list. This will be as objective as possible. Just a note, I won't be including the Titans from the Titan Event Kit Pack when considering how each of the faction ranks. I'm reviewing factions as they come out of the box, and while I was fortunate enough to get one of the Titan Event Kit Packs when they were released, they have now been out of print for a number of years, so for many new and existing players these Titans just won't be accessible. Although I have heard a rumour that it will be reprinted later this year, so let's just wait and see on that. It's different for those factions who are released with a Titan, because the Titan has been considered as part of the balancing and power level of faction. For those factions like the Pirates, the Tricksters and the Wizards, the Titan was released after the faction as an attempt to correct the power level of the faction and those factions that were considered weaker. It will be interesting to see how the factions that did end up getting Titans do rank on my tier list, but with that out of the way, let's just get straight into it. So how am I going to be making the tier list? Well, in this series I'm going to specifically be looking at factions in isolation across 9 characteristics, which I believe provides a comprehensive overview of most, if not all, of the core game mechanics. These are draw power, burst, control, power gain, action enabling, disruption, recovery, phase 3, and standalone VP. Each characteristic is broken down into 5 levels, from non through to maximum, and the reason I've done this is to try and keep it as objective as possible, and I'll be going through a breakdown of the characteristics and the requisite levels over the coming slides. If I made the tier list based on subjective experience, it does start to raise all sorts of problems, so for example, if I played a game with alien zombies and I won before my opponents even managed to get to 5 victory points each, I might then believe that the aliens and the zombies as a combination or as factions individually are S tier. You can then legitimately say, well how good are you at the game, how good were your opponents, how well did you draw, how well did your opponents draw, what were your opponents playing, what was the play count for the game. All of these things shape how the game plays out and these factors are very variable. Additionally, while a pairing might be unreal, the best smash up pairing you could possibly have, it doesn't necessarily tell you how good or bad a particular faction is. It's only con by considering the strengths and weaknesses of a faction and blending those with the strengths and weaknesses of another faction that you can find good pairings. So let's take aliens as an example. They have no draw power and no recovery. If you can strengthen either or both of these things then you're almost certainly going to have a good pairing with the aliens. If you stick them with the zombies for instance, the best recovery faction in the game, boom, you've got yourself a winning pairing. So hopefully by keeping it as objective as possible and by considering each faction only on its own merits, this will give the tier list as much credibility as possible. Inevitably, it is going to throw up some surprises and some things that I'm sure you will disagree with me on. You'll also see a score there in the middle. Each level within a characteristic is assigned a score, that's how I came to the overall positioning for the faction. These aren't weighted. The issue with weighting is how do you make comparisons between each characteristic, so for instance recovery when playing against the sharks might be incredibly important, but in another matchup where your opponent can't really affect your cards, recovery might be less important and draw power might be more important. Additionally, one or a combination of characteristics is embedded within the theme and balancing of each faction. Finally, as I mentioned before, Smash Up is a game of combinations, and while we're looking at each faction individually and assessing their strengths and weaknesses in a vacuum, the pairing you get is such a significant part of the game in complementing strengths and mitigating weaknesses. So for all those reasons it became too difficult to consider weighting the characteristics because actually their importance changes from game to game. Finally, you'll see a rating on the slide about how complex I believe the faction is to play. This isn't scored, this is just to help you when considering if you want to give this faction to newer players for instance. So the first characteristic is draw power, and this one is fairly self-explanatory. It's the ability of the faction to be able to draw or search for additional cards from their deck, beyond the two cards that you draw at the end of every turn. There are some cards which could fit into more than one characteristic, but that's primarily because I've tried to break characteristics down into many areas as possible. So let's say for instance the hoverbot for the robots, which lets you look at the top card of your deck. If it's a minion you can play it as an extra minion. While the hoverbot does draw a card from the deck, I'll be classing that as burst rather than draw power. Likewise the shinobi can be played as an extra minion play during phase 3, I'll be classing that as phase 3 rather than burst. If I wasn't considering phase 3 as its own characteristic then I would class it as burst. However, the more characteristics there are the more diverse this will be, and the more opportunities there will be for the faction's strengths and weaknesses to show through. 
There are some exceptions to this where a card does genuinely fit into more than one characteristic, so for instance abduction for the aliens. These two effects are independent of each other, so the first part can be used to bounce an opponent's minion to hand, which is control, and then you can play an extra minion, which is burst, so the effects are independent. For characteristics like this, which are fairly simple and there's not really much to explain, I won't be dwelling on the slides, so if you do want to read what each level does, then just pause the video. So burst, what do I mean by that? Well, as Smash Up is a game of breaking bases, burst is the ability to play more than one minion in a turn. Looking at the level, a faction with no burst has no way of playing any extra minions beyond their standard one minion per turn. At the other end of the spectrum, a faction with maximum burst can potentially break a base in a single turn, or they can drop an insurmountable amount of power in one turn, which means they effectively lock up first place on the base. Control is one that does have overlap with disruption, however I think they are distinct enough to categorise them as two separate things, and I'll attempt to explain how. I consider control to be ways of directly influencing your opponent's minions, so this is things like destroying minions, returning minions to hand, moving minions, returning minions to your opponent's deck, and other things like that. Smash Up is obviously a game about breaking bases to victory, and to do this you need to use minions. And while there will be some niche exceptions to this rule, so for instance the Kaiju, you can't always cover every circumstance with something as general as a tier list like this. Disruption however is more indirect, it might be a random effect for instance, it doesn't necessarily deal with your opponent's minions, so this will be things like discarding cards, blocking bases abilities, discarding bases, destroying actions in play, changing the power of minions and other things like that. It is a very fine line and I do understand if you may be struggling to see the distinction between the two, but hopefully this and future videos will help. Often factions that are good at control are good at disruption, but not in every case. Power gain is a self-explanatory one, it's simply the ability of a faction to be able to gain power in a temporary or permanent way. This is an interesting one because extra actions are really split into two things. There are restricted and unrestricted extra action plays. Unrestricted extra action plays simply give you an extra action, they aren't limited to certain types of actions, there's not another condition attached like being the strongest minion at a base or destroying one of your own minions. These are obviously the best type of extra actions. Restricted extra actions are like the ones I was just mentioning but there's a conditionality clause attached, but also where the extra action is limited to a play on base or play on minion action. The Baboon for the Cyborg Apes is a really good example of this. The Baboon allows you to play a very specific type of action as an extra action each turn, and it's limited to them being played only on Baboon, so it is a very restricted type of extra action. So this is the other side of the coin to control. I won't reiterate what I covered on the control side, instead hopefully I'll be able to make it clearer that control and disruption are two separate things. Let's take a look at the alien card Jam Signal. Jam Signal allows you to play it on a base, and all other players ignore the base's ability. Now the reason I wouldn't consider this to be a control card is firstly it's not directly influencing minions on the board, and secondly there is an element of randomness to it. Even if you know all the bases in the base deck in the game that you're playing in, let's say you've identified one base that would be really good for your opponent, there's no guarantee that you'll see that base in the game. Therefore it's only a bonus for your opponent if it actually appears, but they aren't relying on it to execute their faction's combination strategy. Therefore it can't be considered to be a controlling card, bases are always complementary to a faction strategy and not integral to it. Control to me is very deliberate, it's reacting to something your opponent's already done, influencing minions on the board as I've already said. Disruption is just more annoying, it might be more random, it can affect your opponent before they get a chance to do something for instance. Recovery again is another straightforward one, this is the ability of the faction to be able to recover or access cards from their discard pile. What do I mean by phase 3? Well phase 3 is quite simply the third step of a turn, which is the base scoring phase, so immediately after you've played your cards for turn. Standalone VP is the ability of a faction to score victory points independently of bases. Bases are the only way for most factions to score victory points and having other ways is actually quite rare, and even when they do, there's almost certainly some condition attached. These are quite detailed complexity levels, I won't read them out here but feel free to pause it or give it a read. A faction doesn't need to do all the things listed in the level to be considered that difficulty, it's just really a guide for the type of things that can be considered. Before we look at the awesome level 9000 factions, I first just want to update the tier list. After some discussion with Radical Dreamer in the comments section of the previous tier list video, I was convinced to add action enabling as an additional characteristic. I had actually considered adding extra actions in as a characteristic, however, I decided against it because my original line of thought was, well, what do extra actions accomplish, if not just more of the existing characteristics, so more draw, more burst, more power, etc, things like that. That fails to capture, however, the potential that multiple action plays in a turn can bring, 
especially for those factions who can't normally play extra actions. So rather than going King Rex and then Rampage, you can now go King Rex Augmentation Rampage to reach on a base you previously couldn't break before. With Giant Ants, you can now do a kind of magic we will rock you win the game, which you couldn't normally do. Fortunately, in the core set, it's literally just the wizards that have extra action plays. They have a lot of unrestricted extra action plays, and this makes them an archetypal maximum action enabling faction. What this means for the tier list is that they are rocketed from F tier to B tier, a similar power level to the robots, but for very different reasons. I was toying with the numbers quite a bit because looking at all the factions, about a third or so gained from including an extra characteristic. For some of them, it didn't change their tier. In the end though, I kept it as it is. But to distinguish those at the very top, I added the double S tier because there would have been too many that would have actually been in the S tier. And some of those in the double S tier are actually two or three points ahead of the S tier factions. I also just subdivided C into the two numbers. With the change to wizards, we've also seen a slight rise for the average power of the core set up to 8.5. The Bear Cavalry have no draw power, and now for those that are non, I'm not going to put the description for that level on the slide as it literally just says they have none of that characteristic. The faction has two cards in the commissions which allow it to play an extra minion in a turn. This is limited to just one extra minion in a turn, and while the additional effect has no bearing on that extra minion play, generally I found this effect to be not overly useful. Often with extra minion plays you're using that extra power to try and reach on a base, either increasing your power to lock up a placement or more preferably break the base. With Commission, however, you aren't necessarily doing that because whatever power you add, so long as there's at least one opposition minion on the base, you're also moving power away. Now this obviously plays into the Bear Cavalry's strategy to move opponents into a destruction effect, and it can be useful to move a minion away to potentially score a base solo. However, in factions that generally rely on one minion player turn, you do need help from your opponent to break bases, otherwise it's a very slow process for you to do it solo and you're more than likely committing 6 or more of your own minions just to do that. As it stands though, Bear Cavalry have to be rated weak for burst. Now you might be looking at the slide and thinking, whoa, this looks like a sure thing maximum to me. And yes, while there are a lot of cards, and while they do combo movement and destruction, I just couldn't class them as a maximum. They have two very good control cards in high ground and you're pretty much borscht, but the rest of the stuff is pretty mediocre. While the Bear Cavalry make the best use out of movement compared to other movement based controlling factions by moving minions to destroy them, apart from high ground the destruction element is limited to minions of power 2 or less. The Cub Scout is the cornerstone of the faction but it relies on its power being buffed or your opponent's minions power being lowered to really be effective. For a standard faction there are only 4 viable targets for the Cub Scout. Bear Hug can help in those instances where a faction doesn't follow the standard power structure like the Vigilantes or Princesses. However, in most cases all it does is eliminate a power 2 minion as they're the most prevalent ones, removing one of the available targets then for the Cub Scout. I consider movement to be a weak controlling effect, just because unlike destruction, returning minions to hand, returning minions to deck and other things like that, you aren't getting rid of the power, you're just shifting it to another base, and while that may have its uses, particularly in the short term, it's not denying your opponent victory points in the long run, because the power has just transferred instead. And in Bear Cavalry, You're Screwed and Commission, these are actually more limited movement cards because they're reliant on a or the minion being at the target's base. We saw Shanghai for the Pirates in the last video and that is an unconditional and arguably stronger movement effect. The Creme de la Creme though, High Ground and you're pretty much borscht are excellent. High Ground is the card you want the Cub Scouts to be, unfettered destruction, and while it requires a minion to be on the base this is hardly a restriction. The card single-handedly lifts Bear Cavalry over the medium line into strong. It actually provides an excellent payoff for all the movement the faction has, but it is only one card unfortunately, but it is easily the strongest card in the faction. Your pretty much boast is very reminiscent of Felicia Day for the geeks, and the reason this card is stronger than your screwed, for instance, is it's simply the scale of the card. If there are two 20 point bases in play and there's a 19 power on each of them, and you have one power 3 minion on both, you can transfer 16 power from one base to the other and make your opponents massively overpay to break that base. You're effectively denying them the second set of victory points they would have scored on the other base. It can also be used to deny a powerful minion, so if your opponent for instance puts their Archmage on its own base, you can simply flood that base using this card to deny them a powerful ongoing ability that they want to keep in play. So to me, the Bear Cavalry have the quantity of controlling cards, but not necessarily the quality of those cards, apart from higher ground and you're pretty much borscht. If you can manipulate the power of the minions, then you can unlock the potential of the Cub Scout, but as it stands, it's just as strong for me. The Bear Cavalry have no way of increasing the power of their minions, and they have no way of playing any extra actions. 
Disruption now, this one was borderline for me. I was possibly feeling sorry for the Bear Cavalry as I do know what's coming, however, this could very easily be a weak rating. General Ivan, I've talked about Buccaneer and Warbot in the last video and how they aren't disruptive because of how few cards actually affects. Well, General Ivan provides the scale that arguably does make it a disruptive effect. Granting all of your minions protection from destruction is strong and can massively swing certain matchups. I don't have an exact count, but my feeling from playing the game extensively is that destruction is the most prevalent controlling effect, with factions that don't even major on destruction having one or two cards that can destroy minions. So this ability is universal enough to be considered disruptive. Bare Necessities is just a straightforward action destruction. Superiority, while in reality it's pretty much universal protection, it doesn't actually protect from placing or shuffling. And this is actually relevant because Disintegrator from the aliens in the core set does bypass this ability. Why they couldn't just make this universal protection from cards like play and base actions we've seen since, I just don't know. I think there are just enough effects and quantity of cards here to call Bear Cavalry Medium for disruption, however, I wouldn't hate a weak rating, although as it stands it wouldn't affect their actual tier position. And rip the Bear Cavalry, they have no recovery, no ways of scoring victory points independently of bases, and no plays in Phase 3. Like the dinosaurs, the lack of game mechanics makes Bear Cavalry a low complexity faction to play. There is a lot of interaction with your opponent and when to play your pretty much borscht for maximum effect can be tricky. However, it is a straightforward play one action, play one minion type of faction and just generally move stuff to the high ground base for the most part. Now for the pairings, just two recommendations from here on in just to save me having to take loads and loads of pictures and transfer them across to my computer. For each faction first, I'll consider a partner that I believe to be very strong and then one that is personally one of my favourites. So starting with the Sumos, I mentioned before that if you can buff the power of your Cub Scouts then that really starts to unlock the potential of the faction, and it lowers the reliance on finding high ground. While the Sumos not only do that in spades, but they also provide draw that the Bear Cavalry desperately lack, as well as plenty of complementary movement cards that really do help to take advantage of those powered up Cub Scouts. The power counters that the Sumos bring also help the pairing to break bases more easily solo, not relying on slowly stacking loads of your minions onto bases anymore. This is a very strong pairing. My favourite pairing though are the Kitty Cats. The Kitty Cats take the opposite approach, providing you with lots of ways to reduce the power of your opponent's minions. Because power is calculated after applying all the effects on a base, once the move is completed, if you play Hissy Fit on a base with a Cub Scout, any power 3 minions that move there will drop to power 2 and can be destroyed. Even better though, with General Ivan and an activated Polar Commando, you can always take advantage of the Kitty Cats extra plays for no downside without being reliant on having to take control of one of your opponent's minions every turn. This is a very fun and surprisingly strong combination. At this stage, this is where I would usually move on to placing the faction onto the tier list, however, as there are only four factions, I'm going to do that at the very end. So next up, the ghosts. So starting with draw power, just the one card for the ghosts in Seance. It is a highly conditional card requiring you to have two or less cards in hand at the time of playing. However, if you can meet that condition, which for the ghosts isn't difficult, it's a very strong draw card. At worst it's a draw 3, which is the same as Tribute, a very strong vanilla draw 3 for the Vikings. And at best it's a draw 5 card, which is crazy strong. This card is most similar to Tech Center. You're only really playing Tech Center when you have at least 3 minions on a base, so that's the kind of same conditionality there but most often you can get 4, 5 or maybe even more card draws from a tech center. Anyway, it's a strong card, but only one card so it has to go down as a weak rating. Ghost fit medium very well for burst. Ghostly arrival is a very solid action and one of the best enabling cards for ghosts to do their big power spike, dump your whole hand kind of play. You can chain both ghostly arrivals into the dead rise for a big burst play to play 4 possible minions in a turn. It's unlikely honestly that you'll do this, but it is a possibility. The Dead Rise, while strictly worse than they keep coming on paper, is one of those enabling cards for the Ghost to dip down to two cards, so for this specific faction you would probably still prefer the Dead Rise to they keep coming. While it is costly to get a power 4 or power 5 minion back for instance, the fact that you can replay it after it's gone to the discard pile is very strong. Again, just three cards, but three very solid cards and I'm very happy to call this one a medium. Spirit is another one of those enabling cards for the Ghosts, allowing them to drop down to two cards for their big power spike turns, this one, however, is a little tricky. On the plus side, the destruction power is capped to 9, which can destroy anything in the game that can actually be destroyed. The destruction can also happen at any base, it doesn't have to be at the base that the spirit is played on. Where this card gets tricky though is that more often I'm using this card as an enabler to get down to two cards than I am actually to destroy a powerful minion. 
Now obviously the card is versatile enough to be used for both, however you're often having to sequence and chain a series of plays in your hand to discard the exact number of cards you need with this card to finish on those two or less cards in your hand and that can be entirely dependent on what minions your opponent has played down. That to me is great though, it requires thought and skill and it's highly satisfying to sequence the cards correctly and play it perfectly. Make contact, while taking control of minions is now more prevalent in the game and it's a recognised mechanic and they've actually refined the wording of it as well. At the time this came out, nothing like this has been seen before, it was such an interesting card. You can tell by the balancing that they weren't sure how broken this could be, so they made it very difficult to actually get it into play and try and future-proof the concept. Unless there's a minion that's so good you can't pass on the opportunity, you actually very rarely want to play this card. The reason being that you can only play it if it's your only card, which means then of course that you have no cards in hand. This then means that your next few turns could be terrible because you're now entirely dependent on the two cards you draw at the end of your turns. The minion you take then has to realistically be better than about two turns of weak or nothing turns. If it is, then by all means play a spirit or a dead rise to leave this as your last card and then take control of it. But in reality this card is mostly discard fodder, which makes it such an interesting card to rank. The potential capability has to be recognised though, and when combined with the spirits, they are two strong effects and a handful of controlling cards, so it is a medium. Power gain is a weak for the ghosts. Both cards are conditional on having two or less cards in hand. And really that should only happen once because you want to be dropping down to two and then blowing up one or two bases with these cards and then they're gone. So good cards, but think of the power gain as like a one-time use. Just these three cards with two or less cards in hand is 16 power in a base and that is absurd. We've seen ghostly arrivals already and this is a card that does span two characteristics. I already mentioned in burst how important this card specifically is when you're trying to manipulate your hand down to two or less. Although it is only two cards, they are both unrestricted extra action plays, slotting ghosts into medium for action enabling. Just a week for disruption in the incorporeals, providing two of your minions with universal protection, although the play on minion action can actually be targeted so this is quite a weak week. This card is interesting as the ghosts don't really have any good targets for the incorporeal. Apart from protecting your hauntings until you're ready to use them, these cards are really just good support cards for the partner faction. We've already seen the Dead Rise, again, like the Ghostly Arrivals in the Burst characteristic, this is another one that does legitimately span two characteristics, as the Burst does come from the discard pile. The Dead Rise can get any minion immediately back into play. Across the Divide is an excellent recovery card to get back any minions that are particularly strong, like both Invaders for instance, and Spectre provides a nice alternate play from the discard pile instead of the hand. This is entirely minion focused though, even if Across the Divide says choose a card name and then it specifies minions, so I think medium is a fair rating. Standalone VP, although there's only one card, I mentioned in the last video that it is rare for a faction to be able to score victory points independently of bases, so to even have a card, even one as conditional as Shady Deal, is excellent. This is one card in the faction that you absolutely do not want to be discarding, this is one of the big payoffs for the faction style of play. At least once in the game you'll get down to two cards in hand, so you would definitely have an opportunity to play it. Think of this like you're only needing 14 points off bases to win, you've had a head start over most other factions every time you pick the ghosts. And for the first time for this faction, we actually have a non. The ghosts have no cards that can be played in phase 3. Looking at all the characteristics now, we can see the power of the ghosts. They do a lot of things and they bring a lot to the table. They don't necessarily major on one or two things, which makes them versatile and a great partner for most factions. With ghosts, generally 80% of the game is played normally, with the other faction as the lead. The other 20% of the time though, you have big turns that focus on playing into the ghost strategy well. It's an unconventional strategy and they're definitely one of the hardest factions in the game to play and play well. Especially with large hands, there's an awful lot of sequencing with extra plays and choosing which cards to discard. Building up to and knowing when to trigger the powerful cards that key off having two or less cards in hand is another added complexity. Going off on a slight tangent and speaking very subjectively here, I feel like ghosts are an unpopular faction, but they're far from a weak faction and I feel like they possibly got a titan to encourage more people to play with them, rather than to boost their power. Finally, turning to pairings now, there are two ways to play the ghosts. You either keep your hand perpetually low and always have the abilities live, or you maintain a big hand size and drop down low for the big power turns. It'll come as no surprise, based on what I've said for the characteristics, that I believe playing a big hand and then dropping down low for those big power turns is the best way to play the ghosts. Keeping your hand size low severely restricts what you can do each turn. While you always have the ghost abilities active, generally they're designed to be used once and not as an ongoing effect. If you play the ghost literally, then I feel like a titan is justified because I think they are much weaker at a constant hand size of 2 or less. The only faction that can arguably get away with this are the zombies, and while I think that the pairing is solid, it's definitely not the strongest pairing for the ghosts. That I believe, however, is the rockstars, although it was a close call with the wizards.
The Rockstars bring you a lot of draw. A big hand and the potential for reload always gives you a lot of options as the ghost player and that is where the strength of the faction lies. In addition, lots of groupy draw always brings you a big power drop from hand that can significantly change the size of your hand at any moment as well. This is a very strong pairing. I mentioned that there were two ways to play ghosts, well actually there is a third. What about burying all the cards from your hand? The ancient Egyptians allow you to bury key cards to use them exactly when you need to. Using lots of extra plays from the board allows you to play low hand size but without the detriment of reducing your options in a turn. Instead you can carefully place and set up all of your pieces for the exact moment you need them, with a flurry of unburying. This is a very different and very fun pairing. We're kicking the killer plants off with a medium for draw power. While they don't have any excellent draw cards, with effectively 7 outs the water lily and the 3 water lilies themselves, and the 4 sprouts, you'll very easily and very consistently draw one extra card every turn, which is solid. And the budding is just a straightforward search card, obviously no good for one odd minions in your deck, but if you have any strong duplicates then this card will just make your deck and strategy more consistent. That is a common theme for the killer plants, they're just a really good support faction. Burst again plays into their role as a support faction. Blossom, while very strong, often won't get played for its full value, as there really aren't many good examples of three minions with the same name, where you won't have already played at least one of them. And if you decide to hold on to them until all three are in your hand, then you might actually be hurting your game state. In addition, this card has no internal synergy, as there are really no viable killer plant targets for this card. So most of the time you either play this as an additional insta-grow, or you'll play two minions down, which is still actually quite good. Venus Mantrap is just a very solid support minion. There are a lot of factions that appreciate a reliable way of drawing their power 2 or less minions, and there are some really excellent power 2 or less minions in the game. Generally though, the more the game goes on, the less you want to draw into power 2 or less minions, so Venus Mantrap just helps to take those cards out of your deck, to hopefully improve the quality of the cards that you're actually drawing. The Instagrows, we've seen this before in the Wizards and their summons. Not much to say here really, just a solid extra minion play. Bear in mind that the Sprout has been errated to trigger at the start of your next turn. The ability to play an extra and better minion from your deck cannot be overstated. The power level of minions as you go up the power tree in most cases increases significantly. You'll use one of the Sprouts to find a Water Lily, but the others are free to be used to play for your partner faction's power 3s. Obviously this is most effective with a partner faction that has an abundance of 3s, so that in the event that you do draw into some of them, there are still some valid targets. So Polynesian Voyagers, Aliens, other factions like that. A very solid outing for the killer plant so far. Choking Vines, this card is most comparable to Assassination of the Ninjas, which we saw in the last video. However, this is far, far worse, entirely because it triggers at the start of your next turn. Because killer plants have no way of playing actions outside of their turn, your opponent will always get a chance to do something before Choking Vines can be triggered. So they can potentially destroy Choking Vines, return the minion to hand, score the base that the minion is on. There are a lot of things that they can potentially do, which would mean Choking Vines never triggers. Even if it does trigger, they still get one more turn with the minion. You're likely to put Choking Vines on your opponent's strongest minion, their King minion for instance. So let's say you put it on your opponent's Archmage and they have no way of getting rid of Choking Vines, they still get one more turn of being able to play an extra action. The only instance where Choking Vines is better than Assassination is to force your opponent to do something or burn three resources in an inefficient way in order to not lose that ability or the power that that particular minion brings. But this is going to be few and far between. A weak week here for Killer Plants. The Killer Plants have no way of adding power to their minions. Interestingly, because the Sprouts have to be destroyed at the start of your next turn, and the Weed Eaters come into play with less power than their printed power, you could actually say that Killer Plants offer less than none for this characteristic. Killer Plants also have no way of playing any extra actions. Killer Plants are a medium for disruption, and that's really entirely because of Sleet Spores and Overgrowth. We'll start with deep roots, in a lot of games this will be useless, it doesn't even prevent destruction, which as I mentioned earlier in the video is probably the most prevalent controlling effect. Entangled is deep roots but for all minions and all players. This effect is better and potentially more disruptive, however the payoff is that you have to have a minion at each base where you want this effect to occur, which realistically is every base, and also it only lasts for one turn. So you potentially delayed the game by one turn and only against specific factions. Now obviously this was released in the same expansion as Steampunks and Bear Cavalry, factions that do have a lot of movement. In addition, you've also got aliens, ninjas and pirates in the core set, which would be affected by this card. So in the context of just the core set and the first expansion, there are five factions of the remaining 11 that are hurt by this effect, which is actually quite strong. But as more factions have been released, you're not as likely to get such a concentration of movement or returning to hand focus factions, so this card does get a lot weaker. 
In Overgrowth, you have an incredibly disruptive card. When you play this card down, it's likely your opponents will abandon whatever they were doing and focus their attention solely on the zero power base that will score next turn. You basically stop what everyone was doing and tell them to do something else for a turn. It's also an opportunity if you have quite a foothold on the base you're going to be targeting with Overgrowth to gain some easy victory points. In theory, Overgrowth could say on it, at the start of your turn your opponents gain 1 VP, you gain 3 VP, discard a base and play. Finally, two Sleep Spores. The Killer Plants don't really have any way of capitalising on the lower power minions beyond simply delaying or changing position on a base. Other factions like Bear Cavalry can obviously use the effect for these purposes, but it can also put minions in range for their destruction by the Cub Scouts. The Killer Plants with their power detraction rather than power gain don't always want to lower the power of your opponent's minions because you don't really have enough power in your own minions to break the bases alone or very quickly. So while they aren't necessarily good for killer plants, they are a good card in isolation and a good one for your partner faction. This is also a good opportunity to explain why I consider power reduction to be disruption and not control, even though power reduction influences minions on the board. This effect doesn't actually control the minion per se, if you change your opponent's 4 power minion to a 3 power minion, they're still going to score on the base, you haven't actually removed that threat. All you've done is just inconvenience them or you've moved them into range for a controlling effect to take place. Even a minion that's been re reduced to power zero will still score on a base. This one was borderline, but in the end I felt that it wasn't really controlling enough. You aren't really resolving the problem with the minion still being there. The killer plants have no recovery, no way of scoring victory points independently of bases, and no cards that can be played in phase three. The killer plants are a low complexity faction and well suited as a support faction. You'll regularly play extra minions and draw an additional card each turn, but really the most complex decision the faction poses is setting up the overgrowth play, making sure that you're in a position to score as many victory points as possible from that card. On to the pairings now, and for the top tier pairing I'm going to say that that is the superheroes. Killer plants provide an above average number of power 5 minions to make full use of the mild mannered citizens and justice friends. Additionally, because the mild mannered citizen triggers at the start of your turn, the four sprouts effectively give you 9 outs to mild mannered citizens, each sprout counting as a pseudo mild mannered citizen. Also, you can use your first Mild Mannered Citizen to bring out your Venus Mantrap, which then lets you bring out more Sprouts or Mild Mannered Citizens, to bring more of your Power 5 minions into play. You can break bases very quickly this way, and then you have two copies of Golden Age to quickly recycle your Power 5s and do it all over again. It's a very strong pairing. Second, for my personal favourite pairing, we have the Ancient Incas. And the only reason this pairing is on here is for this specific play. You play down the Overgrowth on one base and the Sprout on a different base, Next turn, at the start of your turn, you sprout into a llama and replay the overgrowth on that base. Because it's still the start of your turn when this happens, now two bases will break during phase three. One your opponents knew about, and one that came absolutely out of nowhere. And while I wanted to highlight that, the Ancient Incas do allow you to recover the overgrowth. The Killer Plants have quite a few play on base actions, which can play into the Incan Engineer and the Armoury. So this one is here for the combo wombo, but it's actually quite a solid pairing as well. Just the one draw card for the Steampunks in Difference Engine. There's not a whole lot to say here, drawing an extra card at the end of your turns is good. It's very easy to meet the attached condition of having a minion at the base. Drawing a card at the end of your turn isn't as good as drawing one at the start or during your turn, as you can't then use that card until your next turn, but it does potentially mean that you can go into your next turn with 11 cards in hand, as the extra card draw is after you'll draw two cards per turn. Steampunks have no way of playing extra minions and no means of control. A solid medium here for the Steampunks in power gain. The Steam Man, we've actually seen better power 3 minions that act like power 4 minions since the Steam Man, so this really hasn't aged very well. While you're very likely to activate the plus 1 power, this is a very underwhelming card. What we're really here for though are Agrimotive and Rotary Slug Thrower, two very strong power gain cards. Rotary Slug Thrower is still the gold standard for giving power to each of your minions on a base. We saw Door to the Beyond earlier for the Ghosts, which had the two cards in hand conditionality clause, this has no such restriction. Whereas Rotary Slug Throw plays into the Swarm strategy, Agrimotive on the other hand is there for the high power, low minion concentration strategy, providing just a solid plus 5 power. Pair it with a power 4 or a power 5 minion, and with 9 or 10 power at a base, you pretty much guarantee yourself second place at any player count for just 2 cards. Just a week for action enabling, as you can see there are just 3 cards, the extra actions are limited to play and base actions, and there is a conditionality attached. The card either has to already be in play for change of venue, or it has to already be in the discard pile for mechanic. Both cards are strong, change of venue allowing you to preserve your difference engine for further value, or to switch Agrimotive or Rotary Slug Thrower for additional surprise power, 
a mechanic allowing you to replay strong play on base actions. However, they are both very restricted and this has to go down as a weak. While there are three cards for disruption for steampunks, this is a weak three. Escape Hatch prevents your minion destruction on a base which can disrupt some destruction base factions, however, because the minion still goes to hand, they have still removed the minion from the board, which is important if they intend to score the base that turn, you do have to play it again, it is bad anti-tempo for you. Steam Queen, because of its universality in all of your actions not being affected by other players' cards, not just your player base actions, this does provide some limited disruption. It blocks common action removal effects as well as protecting against cards like Force of Will from the Geeks. Ornate Dome is actually the strongest of the three and even then this isn't that disruptive. You can destroy all player base actions which can be good against certain factions, however, those factions with lots of player base actions are most likely to be paired with the Steampunks anyway, not against them. It also prevents any player base actions from being played at that base. There are a lot of factions that have one or two player base actions so this can be disruptive. Unfortunately though, unlike Disenchantment, this card only affects player base actions and not any action so even then it's still not that good. Steampunks are just a medium for recovery because their recovery is limited to just actions. Scrap Diving lets you get back any action, it's not restricted in any way and it goes back to the hand instead of the top or bottom of the deck or being shuffled in for instance, which is much much stronger. Mechanic is restricted to playing base actions but it does let you replay it immediately rather than you putting it into hand. Steampunks have no way of scoring victory points independently of bases and no cards that can be played in phase 3. They're a low complexity faction, while they do have some extra action plays that aren't many and all the card abilities are very straightforward, there are no interactions with your opponent's cards and all in all this is a good faction for beginner players. For the top tier pairing you really just want to play into their strengths and play with any faction that focuses on play and base actions. Of those listed here, if I had to pick one to play with Steampunks in a tournament, I'd probably go with the Ancient Incas. Although Dragons and Replaying Ruins is really good, the Ancient Incas just provide you with so much additional power in the Fortress Walls and Armouries to go with your Rotary Slug Thrower and Agrimotive. With the Incan Engineers and Sapper Inca, you can draw a play on base actions from your deck, and Child of the Sun allows you to start playing them down quickly to really increase the power on bases. With the Llamas you can reposition the actions at will, and with Ashlar Masonry you can preserve key actions. This would definitely be my top competitive pick for the Steampunks. For my fun pick though, I know it's a bit of a cop out choosing zombies as they pair well with almost anything, however this is because they do offer two genuinely powerful solo base breaks in the pairing, and only this pairing. Let me talk you through them. First one, let's imagine you play down Rotary Slug Thrower and Zombie Lord on the same empty base. Then you move two of your power team minions you got with the Zombie Lord to that base with your Zeppelins. Let's add a Tenacious Z play onto that base too. Then you can move one or more Captain Ahabs to that base as well depending on how many you already have in play, you may have got one or two of them back from the Zombie Lord. If you did get them back from the Zombie Lord then you don't even need the Zeppelins. We'll say one Ahab for this example. Now in just one turn you've dropped 23 power onto a single base and you've probably broken it. The second combo is to play Overrun on a base, again let's assume there's nothing on that base. Then you also play your minion for turn, we'll just say a Steam Man. Next turn you play your mechanic to replay Overrun onto that base. Again, we'll add a Tenacious Z this turn as well. The next turn then we'll play They Keep Coming to get the other mechanic from the discard pile to again play the overrun. You've now got 13 power on the base and you haven't even played your minion play for that turn and you still have next turn to play more cards so it should be a second base you break solo. A really different pairing for the zombies but it is actually a really good pairing and there are those two really good combos that you're working towards in that game. So here we have it. The final awesome level 9000 tier list, we have our first S tier faction, the Ghosts, as well as the Bear Cavalry in the F tier, Steampunks in the D tier, and Killer Plants in the low C tier. Let's add them to the overall smash up tier list. So with them added, we're beginning to flesh out the tier list a bit. Generally more factions in the core set and awesome level 9000 are towards the bottom of the tier list, as you can see from the average power level of the sets on the right, but we do have some solid B, A and S tier factions. What do you think of the tier list so far? What do you agree with? What don't you agree with? How would you realistically make a tier list? Let me know down in the comments below and with that being said, I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.